And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fedit. Welcome to Fedit. Uh, today we're gonna be covering the Night Stalker, guys. We got a lot to cover, man. This is probably one of the most prolific serial killers in Los Angeles history, especially during the 1980s. Let's get into it, guys. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what FedEx covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. See him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA, who shikes he violated. You're ordered to stay away from the victim. Trapper, who shikes he arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured I mean, this one is person. The, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, what happened at the gun range? Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. Yeah. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to love my fifth limit right right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect to set down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al-Qaeda. Two terrorists, their brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, we're back. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed it, Man. Uh, so today we're going to be covering the Night Stalker, man. Uh, you guys have been requesting this one for quite a while. For some of you guys that aren't aware, very famous case from the 80s, a uh, serial killer that literally terrorized Southern California and San Francisco um, between 1984 to 1985. Uh, there's a Netflix series special on it called The Night Stalker. Um, I may or may not play a clip from it. Uh, the, the documentary is very good. I remember watching it years ago. Um, but yeah, it's still on Netflix, man, which tells you because quite frankly, Netflix gets rid of stuff very quickly. So the fact that it's still on years later proves that it is very popular. Um, so quick announcements, guys. Um, number one, rumble.com slash fresh and fit guys. As you guys know, we're on rumble. Uh, don't worry. We're still going to be on YouTube. We're still gonna be posting all of our content on YouTube. However, with the after hour shows more than likely, we're going to be switching, you know, back and forth between rumble and, um, YouTube. But all the daytime shows are going to stay on YouTube as usual in full. And then a large part, you know, half the after hour shows are going to be on, excuse me, YouTube. And then you'll be able to go ahead and catch us on uh, Rumble for the rest. And what else here? And then we're on Locals, guys. Locals.freshandfit, or sorry, freshandfit.locals.com. You know, if you want to get the behind the scenes stuff, we're moving away from Patreon. And um, also, this podcast is on Anchor, guys. Anchor.fm, Fox Mike slash fed at 1811 anchor.fm slash fed at 1811 mo's doing a great job of um you know uploading all the episodes on there so if you guys want to listen to it on audio feel free to check me out over there spotify google app podcast all the single uh the platforms that you guys have come to learn and love for podcasting um and yeah i think christine is going to walk in here guys in the middle of the show she's just got back from uh from boston she'll be helping me out in today's episode but in the meantime while i'm by myself here let me go ahead and read some of these chats uh, hey, Mark, thanks for all your Money Mondays advice. 740, 740 credit score. Mercedes on the way. Are you streaming on Rumble just in case? Keep up the good work. No, I'm streaming also on Twitch, guys, just so y'all know, because I'm going to be playing quite a few um, clips from different places. So I may or may not get taken down, as we always knew, just know, just like with the Ted Bunny situation. Um, and if I do, I'll make sure I re upload the episode um, immediately after. Okay. So um, if it does go down, make sure you have Twitch open, um, twitch.tv slash fresh and fit podcast i think it is um just in case guys and i'll i'll spam the uh link in if i do get taken down um we got here hassler c goes yo Myron, could you do the lissandro guzman Feliz case who got murdered by machetes in new york the trinitario gang to be specific uh i think yes i think i know what you're talking about the 15 year old kid who they thought like did something to their sister um i could that hasn't been requested guys i try to cover cases that everyone is requesting that's what i try to uh prioritize <laughs> 
um, you know, uh, as far as like getting uh, airtime. Um, let me make sure here. I got all the chats before I get into this. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay, yeah. And Michael Chilstein, one dollar. Thank you so much. But yeah, guys, I tried to um, prioritize what y'all want. So next, I got coming up. I'm going to be covering the railroad killer as well as um, the Zodiac Killer. You guys have been asking for the Zodiac Killer forever. Um, but here's the thing with the Zodiac Killer, they never caught him, guys. So I'm doing quite a bit of research, and I'm also going to go ahead and give you all predictions on who I think the actual Zodiac Killer was. There's three main suspects um, that they had, and uh, you know I'll be covering all that. That Zodiac Killer one is going to be long. I ain't going to lie to you all. <laughs> that one is definitely going to be long. Um, probably, I would say him and Jack the Ripper are probably the most famous unsolved serial killer cases of all time more than likely and i'll also be covering uh the yorkshire uh ripper as well uh peter sutcliffe so uh, don't worry guys i got a lot of heat coming for y'all man um the nice darker one this one has been requested for a very long time so i'm making sure that i cover it but um more than likely i think the next one i'm gonna do as far as like a documentary breakdown goes i'm gonna go ahead and cover the railroad killer for you guys next and also the other thing i want to let you guys know is 9 11 is finally done i went ahead and did the entire, and I'll show you guys real fast, 9-11 um, series, okay? And I covered it, literally, guys, I don't think there's anyone that's covered 9-11 more extensively. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys this real quick before we get into today's topic. Uh, so if you go over to my channel right here, right, FEDA1811, um, and we got 655 of y'all watching right now, guys, so please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Um, I cover everything, right? I got, obviously, the most popular videos, a lot of the rapper ones, right? You know, YSL, O Block, you know, YNW Melly, Take Off. Then um, I got, you know, all the videos, the most recent to oldest, and then live streams, of course, and then crime documentary breakdowns. So what I went ahead and did, guys, was I made an entire, um, well, I'm doing a serial killer playlist for y'all, right, to keep it nice and organized. Obviously, we got the Unabomber, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, uh, Ted Bundy, and now we're doing um, the, the infamous Night Stalker. But... Um, I also went ahead and did a 9-11 one for you guys right here, right? So I covered the 1993 World Trade Center bombings, right, which kind of precipitated all this. Then we get into 9-11, how the FBI solved it step-by-step. I go into detail about the FBI investigation. Then we go ahead and we cover Osama bin Laden, right, because the FBI identified bin Laden and Al-Qaeda as the perpetrators. Then we cover the, um, uh, where is it here? The CIA. I what? What happened to it? Did it get taken down? Oh, my God. I hate this shit. Okay, yeah, I got another video, guys, where I cover how the CIA, all right, went ahead and um, identified bin Laden, etc. So I have that as well and what the SEALs found in the house. And and then, let me see. Maybe it's under here. Documentaries. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, how the CIA found him. And then where did they take that one down? I guess so. All right. Don't worry about that. I'll cover that one, guys. And then um, I'll put it back up. Something must have happened. And then here's the 9-11 conspiracy ones. I did three different episodes on it, guys, because it was a five-hour documentary I broke down, uh, uh, the new Pearl Harbor. And we go over all the conspiracy theories with 9-11 from controlled demolitions to, you know, fighter jets not being available, all kinds of inconsistencies that occurred on 9-11, man. So go ahead and check it out, guys. Um, but anyway, let's get back to today's topic at hand. Uh, so don't worry, I'll handle the 9-11 stuff. <laughs> I just realized that just now. God damn it. This guy's hating. Um, all right, so guys, who? so today's topic is the Night Stalker. Let's get into it, okay? So uh, Richard Ramirez, okay, uh, right here. Bam. Okay, Ricardo Richard Leva Munoz Ramirez, uh, born February 29, 1960, to die June 7, 2013, dubbed the Night Stalker, Valley Intruder, was were first clustered in the San Gabriel Valley and walk-in killer, was an American sailor killer whose crime spree took place in California between June 1984 and August 1985. He was convicted and sentenced to death in 1989. He died in 2013 while awaiting execution. And then here they go into his childhood, which don't worry, we're going to cover that right now. So uh, let's get into it, guys. We're going to go into the humble beginnings of the Night nice Stalker. Before I do, like the video, guys. And then also, I need you guys. Let's see here. Uh, I think I saw a chat come in before I do this. Keem Chillin goes, do Natalie Holloway. Okay. Uh, Tony Green, two bucks. Appreciate that. And then we got Austin Azich goes, yo, Meyer, what uh, uh, appendix holster do you have? Is it for a Glock 19? Uh, yeah, I have I have an insane Kydex one for the Glock 19, and I have a Filster one, P-H-L-S-T-R-E-R, -E for my Glock 26, which actually it's right next to me here. Yeah, I can see it. It's uh, This is the, the holster that I use. All right. Let's, uh, let's get into it, gentlemen. Get my ugly mug out the way. 
It's over half a century ago. Richard Ramirez was born on February the 29th, 1960, to Mexican-born parents in El Paso, Texas. He was the youngest of five children, and the family had quite a, a kind of turbulent life. So they, they lived in, in several different areas, many of which had quite high levels of industrial pollution. Some of his siblings had been born with birth defects. So this family had an awful lot of, of challenges. That's something that would come to shape Richard's life and those of his siblings. So he hasn't got the best start in life. And life did not get much better for Ramirez. At a young age, he began rebelling against his strict Catholic upbringing. He's nine, his brain is still developing, he's sniffing glue, he's smoking marijuana. There, there's emotional trauma that's happening in, in the family too. His father was a brutal, short-tempered man. I'm not suggesting it was classic child abuse, but there was certainly physical violence. And Richie Ramirez shrank away, if you like, from his father. And you guys are starting to realize here that with a lot of these serial killers, man, they come from really messed up backgrounds, you know, whether the, fa the father wasn't there or the father was abusive or there was violence. Um, this goes to show the importance, man, of parenting and growing up in a stable household. When you got a fucked up house, it's almost always going to cause trauma and issues for the, for the child. You know, we look at even other serial killers that we've covered, such as like, um, Jeffrey Dahmer came from a two parent household, but his mom was pretty much a drug addict. She was going crazy. You know what I mean? Uh, acting wild. And he watched his parents fight all the time. Like the, these unstable homes cultivate almost a, a breeding ground for becoming a degenerate. So, and it's going to get crazier here. And he took refuge in the company of a cousin. Ramirez's cousin, Mike, returned from the Vietnam War in 1971. He and for some of you guys that are wondering, because a lot of you guys are young and you guys, you know, aren't familiar with the Vietnam War. Uh, we had <laughs> that was a war pretty much that the United States uh, shouldn't have got involved with. But that's a whole other thing. Either way, atrocities. One of the most violent wars lost a lot of soldiers, many violent things. It was one of the uh, situations, one of the first times that. Uh, the modernized American military was exposed to guerrilla warfare, and a lot of the soldiers that went over there to Vietnam came back fucked up, and his cousin was no different. He was scarred by the atrocities he'd seen and had committed as a Special Forces Green Beret. So we have a grizzled, damaged Vietnam vet. And Green Beret, guys, is like, you know, cream of the crop. You know, we're talking about special, uh, damn near Special Forces in the military, uh, you know, very hardened soldiers. So he was in the front lines for real. Uh, can we get a show on Silk Road? Yes, I will do one. And just so y'all know, I'm on Twitch, guys, because I'm going to be playing different clips. And as y'all know, YouTube is kind of lame. They'll take a video down just if they see you using other documentaries or whatever and reacting to it. So if they do, uh, especially in a live stream format, we'll be up on Twitch. You guys can still watch the show. I'll take it down, then I'll re-upload it for y'all later tonight if that happens. That's why I'm on Twitch. Mike and a frail, probably suggestible boy. And Mike proceeds to explain to him the dreadful things he's done to Vietnamese women while in Vietnam. He's tied them to trees, he's raped them, he's beheaded them, he's taken photographs of it. He came home telling stories of this. So, yo, imagine that. You're an impressionable child, right? Your cousin comes back from war. You look up to him and he's telling you, yeah, dude, I was there killing all kinds of people. I was tying chicks up. I was, you know, graping them, etc. I, uh, you know, and he took pictures and he was showing it like, you know, obviously this is back in the 70s. He's taking a picture. He took Polaroids and brought them back with him and is showing his cousin. You know what I mean? Who's a young, impressionable kid. And it's like, this is how he's growing up. And this is someone that he looked up to. Right. So because it wasn't like his his cousin was like a slouch in the military. No, he was a Green Beret, man. That's like just see, I want to know compared to somebody that's Rambo right there. Rambo was a Green Beret in the movie. So. Um, clearly, he uh, respected this guy, and from him being such a, uh, I guess, uh, an inspiration to him, it was in the wrong way. And you guys can see here, the guy is literally, you know, proud of his um, uh, exploits in Vietnam, so to speak. To, to Richard, and he would boast about it. So Richard now has a real-life killing machine to look up to and to admire. 
12-year-old Ramirez was fascinated by his older cousin. So he starts spending an awful lot of time with Mike. He's, he's quite a, a significant influence on young Richard's life, and he's very impressionable at this age. So, so this really is kind of cementing some of those ideas that he's had about harming other people in order to feel powerful. And that must have distorted Ramirez's value systems and the way in which he responded to women in general. They became objects, they were not real, and they became, how can I put it politely, not entirely human. On May the 4th, 1973, Ramirez Asagini. witnessed an event that would cement his feelings towards women and his admiration for Cousin Mike. This is crazy, guys, uh, what you're about to see here. And this this right here is probably going to be one of the turning points in his upbringing. Um, since you're on a serial killing spree, uh, let's get that Charles Manson episode. Yeah, I, I will do Charles Manson. You guys have been re uh, requesting that one for a bit. I'm researching him right now as we speak. Um, yeah, I'm researching so many of these serial killers for y'all, man. Uh, Yo, Mark, can you do South Park Mexican sometime in the future? Stay safe, brother. Yeah, it's not as high on the party list, man, but I will do it, SPM. I know you guys have been asking for that. Can you do the Madeline McCain case, or do you think parents did it? Much love from the UK. Uh, never got a request for that one. That one have to be go, go down the queue, but um yeah okay let's go ahead and uh keep going so yeah this is a turning point for richard ramirez here he keeps his gun in the fridge because he says he likes to keep it cool uh, and this is another thing i think that quite impresses richard and one day mike has a, a huge argument with his wife and ends up killing her he shoots her in the face and yeah, guys, the argument was actually very stupid. It was over like groceries. <laughs> like they had a dumb argument over groceries and he just picked up a gun and shot her right in the face, man. Didn't give a fuck. Right in front of right in front of Rich Ramirez. Right? Imagine seeing that as a kid. And Richard is there in the house when this happens. What you've got here is it's a combination of things that have been going on. So a young lad who, who looks up to people who are violent, a young lad who hears stories of violence, and now he's actually seeing it happen. Mike was a powerful influence in the direction of psychopathy, rage discontrol, and the merger, and this is the most important thing, the merger of sexual impulses and violent impulses into a single coherent force. Now the impact that must have had on a boy who's been taking marijuana with a man who he clearly hero worships. It must have scrambled Ramirez's brain. And also, just to let y'all know, man, um, back in the 70s, marijuana wasn't like it is today. You know, in the 70s and 80s, marijuana was super uh, illegal. It was on the same level as like, you know, cocaine and heroin and all this other stuff. It's, it was a schedule one drug back then, guys, which means it was considered to be one of the worst. So, um, his cousin and him smoking weed back then was a big deal. It's not like today where, you know, everyone is, has marijuana cards and it's, you know, legalized in some states, even though it's still legal federally. It was, it was very ne um, shunned upon to be using uh, marijuana back then. And his reaction to it is quite interesting because when he talks about it afterwards, he doesn't talk about how he feels seeing this woman murdered in front of him. He talks about it very objectively. He talks about the, the body falling to the floor, about blood spurting out of the, the wound. It's not about feeling disgusted or feeling traumatized or sad. He's, he's just giving a very cold description. And I think this really does tell us what kind of person Ramirez is turning into. Mike was immediately arrested. In court, he was judged to be not guilty on the grounds of insanity. Instead of prison, he was sent... And that goes to show you guys how fucked up some of the soldiers were when they came back from uh, Vietnam. You know, he went over there, probably fairly sane, came back with Polaroids of uh, women that he had killed and tortured and graped, and uh, then he shoots his wife over a petty argument on groceries and kills her, right? Right in front of his little cousin. So, yeah, you, you ain't all in, uh, you're not uh, definitely on some weirdo type shit. Stop it. Get some help. So. Sent to a mental institution and released in 1977. Ramirez, in the meantime, because he's removed from his hero, goes to stay with his sister and husband. 
He's lost his idol. He's lost his role model. And he is basically now starting to, to ruminate and to, to think about the things that he wants to do. So he doesn't look after himself. He's very unkempt. He's dirty. Uh, he doesn't wash. And so he becomes even more of an outcast. So he very much gets lost in his own head at this point in time. And he's planning what he's going to do next. Age 17, Ramirez was ready to turn his twisted fantasies into reality. All right, so now he's about to start enacting on the wildness, guys, that he learned from his cousin. Um, and you can see, like, the, 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 now that fucked up background that he comes from is starting to take shape. Uh, we got here, Tony Green. Can you put those platforms on screen that you told us about earlier? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Basically, guys, it's, you know, rumbles, uh, rumble.com slash fresh of fit. Next, uh, fresh of fit dot locals dot com. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm on anchor as well with, um, with feta 1811 anchor.fm slash fresh, uh, sorry, uh, feta 1811. So, uh, let's keep going. He was still at school. He got a job working at a holiday inn and he got a pass key for all the rooms. And he took it upon himself one day. And this is in El Paso, Texas, if I'm, Texas, if I'm not mistaken. To decide that while the husband was away parking the car, he would go into the room that they just both moved into and he would attempt to rape the wife. The husband comes in Stupid. and he sees what's going on and basically beats Richard Ramirez to a bloody pole. But this couple, they're from out of town. They're, they're on holiday. They, they don't want to follow this up. They don't want to, to pursue this case. The couple decided not to press charges. It was a lucky escape for Ramirez. Living on the edges of society, his behavior became more and more unpredictable. So he's dirty, he's unkempt, he's sleeping in graveyards. He's increasingly kind of going over to the dark side. And the things that appeal to him are things that most people would find really odd and really bizarre, devil worship, that sort of thing. So he's gone on this trajectory now, and I think that's only going to go one way. Age eight. All right, so you guys can see he starts to pick up Satanism, okay, which, uh, real quick for y'all, Satanism is a group of ideological and philosophical uh, philosoph philosophical beliefs based on Satan. Um, <clears throat> uh, contemporary religious practice of Satanism began with the founding of the uh, Atheistic Church of Satan by Anton LaVey in the United States in 1966. Although a few historical precedents exist, parts of public practice, Satanism existed primarily as an accusation by various Christian groups toward perceived ideological exponents rather than a self-identity Satanism and the concept of Satan has also been used by artists and entertainers for symbolic expression. So you guys can see here the inverted pentagram uh, circumscri circumscribed by a circle. This, guys, is actually what I use as a thumbnail. This is what your boy... Uh, up oh, did 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 YouTube just take me down? Yeah, I for I I for I figured. All right, cool. Come on. <laughs> All right, so it's switch time. I knew this was happening. All right, so hold on one sec. Here, I got y'all. We're live on. I'm going to put the link in here for y'all right now. I knew YouTube was going to be lame. I predicted it. So come on over, gentlemen. I'll give it a second. Come on over, guys. Oh, now it's back. <laughs> All right, we're back on YouTube. I knew this was going to happen, guys. So, you know, it is what it is. They take it down. We are back on YouTube, but that's what happens. But yeah, go, come on over to Twitch, guys, just in case it happens again. <clears throat> we're back. All right. So anyway, uh, so he, he um, you know, expresses some Satanism, right? He gets involved with, with Satanism. And also, he moves to California. So as he moves to California, guys, give me one sec here. 
He moves from El Paso all the way to California after his failed grape attempt on that woman. And El Paso, guys, y'all can see, is right here on the Mexican border across from Juarez, okay? And this is, uh, this is El Chapo's area right here of Juarez, okay? So he goes all the way to California, L.A., which is, you know, 12 hours by car, you know, probably a few hours by plane. So he moves, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and cover him moving over to, uh, to California. Of a guest in an El Paso hotel, Ramirez moved to California. So after he takes the L, he moves to California. He became a cocaine and alcohol addict. He lived in what's called Skid Row in Los Angeles, which is a pretty scruffy area. I mean, there are people doing everything and taking everything, and homelessness is not an unusual thing. You live in what's called a flop house, where you go and flop uh, to, to get off your high or to recover. Now, did the drugs affect his brain functioning? Did it? Now, real quick, guys, just because we got a lot of international viewers, you guys might not know what Skid Row is. So Skid Row, guys, is um, a neighborhood in downtown Los Angeles. The area is officially known as Central City East. As of uh, 2019 count, the population of the district was 8,757. Skid Row contains one of the largest stable populations about of homeless people in the United States, okay, and has been known uh, for its condensed homeless population since at least the 1930s. Its long history of po police raids, targeted city initiatives, and homelessness advocacy make it one of the most notable districts in Los Angeles. So this is where your boy... Uh, Rich Ramirez was living uh, when he first came to L.A. So at this point, he's addicted to cocaine, right? He's a thief. He's stealing from people, breaking into houses, etc. This is um, this is where he was living uh, in between getting high and robbing people and committing crimes. It affected the way he saw the world, probably, but it wasn't causative. It didn't lead to make him kill. He was already primed. Ramirez lived day to day, taking drugs, using prostitutes, stealing cars, breaking and entering. So as y'all can see, right? So it starts right with um, it starts with the childhood, right? Messed up household, abusive father, links up with his cousin, who he looks at as an idol. Cousins involved in you know nefarious activity over in Vietnam while he's serving as a soldier right? Killing women, abusing them, torturing them, taking Polaroids of his graping activities, etc. So uh, Richard Ramirez thinks, you know what? Let me try this myself. Tries to grape a woman while he's working at a hotel in El Paso. And, you know, the couple, boyfriend and her husband finds out, beats the crap out of them. They don't press charges. They're on vacation. They're like, ah, whatever. We don't, it is what it is. This idiot didn't get successful. And what ends up happening is Rich says, you know what? I'm getting out of Texas. I'm going to California. Right. A part, a part of him also is like, yo, drugs are easier to get there. Um, potentially, I'm moving somewhere else that I've never been before. I'm 18 years old. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, explore. So he gets out to California. What does he do? He surrounds himself with other vagrants, right? In Skid Row. We talked about Skid Row being one of the highest homeless populations in the U.S., one of the worst places to be. He's using drugs. He's getting involved in petty crimes to make ends meet to fix his drug habit, et cetera. And also another thing I want you guys to pay attention to is he's very unkempt. He smells, doesn't brush his teeth, uh, very dirty, and uh, has a distinct odor. These pieces of evidence, these characteristics end up coming back later to help the police identify him, all right? And don't worry, guys, I'm going to re-upload this video later on in full without any distractions, so don't worry. I got y'all, baby. So he would go out in the suburbs where uh, often they did not lock their doors at night even. They didn't lock their windows. This was like heaven for him. This is exactly what he was looking for. And he would go through the unlocked doors and unlocked windows. Sometimes he would go in and burglarize when nobody was home at night. And then he got bolder and bolder and bolder. 
The vast majority of burglaries are for material gain. These are usually drug people who want to get some money to buy drugs, and they might do it with a friend or a partner and, and so on. But there are a small group of burglars that are sexually motivated, where the burglary itself is motivated by an urge to look, sexual stimulation through looking. And since about 50% of burglaries occur, occur in the evening when the victim is likely to be home, it's very easy to see the progression from voyeurism to break and entry to... Yeah, I know, guys. I got taken down on YouTube. Come on over to... Uh... Come on over to uh, to Twitch. Sexual assault or to sexual murder. By May 1985, Richard Ramirez had killed at least eight times, and his violent home invasions were about to escalate, plunging the people of Los Angeles into panic. So at this point, guys, see, as y'all can see, he's already, you know, he's going wild now. Now he's killing all kinds of people. He's breaking into homes and his evil acts are starting to take um, starting to take a shape. And on top of that, the dude fucking worships Satan. Like, what the hell is going on here? So in his head, he's looking at it like, oh, uh, I'm I'm acting in the right. These people deserve to die. I should be the one going ahead and stealing all their stuff. I'm I'm entitled to this stuff. A lot of the times, you know, you know, hurting hurting people, committing crimes, guys, isn't easy for a lot of people to do. So they have to, you know, create little barriers right to make themselves feel better about what they're doing he knows what the fuck he's doing is wrong so that's why he starts taking a, a liking to listening to heavy metal rock at this point um satanic type music he starts um you know saying i i worship satan etc all these little conveniences to make himself feel better about the fact that he's uh you know hurting and killing people and not only that guys he didn't just do this like um these murders like oh let me just shoot them and ca call it a day no he was shooting them. He was mutilating the bodies. He was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So, um, all right. So now we've covered a couple of things. So now we're going to go ahead and cover some of the crimes. Okay, guys? Yes, I know, guys. L for Susan on YouTube. L for Susan. It's all good, though. Come on over to Twitch. The 17th of March, 1985, and Gil Carrillo. Again, guys, the link is top, uh, tapped up below. It's uh, twitch.tv slash fresh and fit podcast. Twitch.tv slash fresh and fit podcast. Come on over, and uh, we're going to keep playing. I'll end the YouTube stream now. A young homicide detective with the L.A. County Sheriff's Department was called to an incident in the Rosemead District. Sunday evening. 1040 at night, call uh, comes in, very typical. Okay, Gil, you got one dead, one uh, wounded, and I'm just going to work another routine mundane murder. Carrillo didn't yet know it, but this murder would be anything but routine. So this is the first main murder, guys, where they were able to identify um, Rich Ramirez as the guy, and this one's a very grotesque crime scene. We entered the location uh, on Village Lane. Dale Okazaki was lying on her back in the kitchen. She had sustained a gunshot wound to the head. 34-year-old Dale Okazaki had been unloading groceries when a man entered her apartment and executed her where she stood. Craziness, man. still see her uh, today. Dale's flatmate, 22-year-old Maria Hernandez, had also been shot at point-blank range, but had survived. She didn't recognize her attacker, and nothing had been taken from the property. We just had our work cut out for us. We didn't know if there was an angry boyfriend, if it was a home invasion robbery gone awry, what it was. Detectives then learned that the killer had struck again. So he starts going on a spree, guys, at this point. So the bodies are about to start racking up. It occurred about a half hour later. It was in the same general area of town, uh, and the same gun was used. 
In nearby Monterey Park, 30-year-old law student Say Lan Yu had been driving home when another driver forced her to stop, then shot her twice in the chest at close range. Almost immediately, uh, we were aware that we had uh, some sort of a series going, not knowing just how big it was going to get or grow. The nature of the crimes was not typical of a serial killer. The overwhelming majority of serial sexual murderers kill up close and personal. Manual strangulation, ligature strangulation, multiple stab wounds, blunt force trauma. Very, very rarely do they shoot somebody because it's too cold and too impersonal. Yeah, so this is something, guys, that made the Night Stalker actually pretty hard to find was that he was very unpredictable on he was unpredictably predictable if i'm going to keep it nice and succinct because he was shooting people he was stabbing people he was hitting them with tire irons he was um attacking all different types of victims men women children everybody no one was safe from this fucking guy so um that in itself made him very difficult to deal with and identify as well at some point people thought yo it's got to be more than one guy there's multiple murderers in here but um you know obviously the, the main detectives on this case were able to um Salerno and the other guy, I forget his name at the moment, were able to pinpoint it as to being one killer. On the morning of March the 27th, the bodies of 64-year-old Vincent Cesaro and his 44-year-old wife Maxine were discovered in their home in the pleasant suburb of Whittier. The same gun had been used, but behavior at the crime scene was significantly different. Vincent Cesaro had been shot as he slept. Maxine had been shot and stabbed repeatedly, and the killer had taken a gruesome souvenir. Very violent, man. The woman's eyes were gouged out, not to be found. Gows out her eyes, man. Fucking crazy. Many serial murderers take souvenirs from people that they kill, whether it's a piece of flesh, piece of jewelry, something. It is a concrete reminder. It's something they can see, something they can hold on to, something that says, wow, you did this. On April the 15th, two weeks after the murder and mutilation of the Zazaras, the killer appeared to have struck again. Linda Martinez was called to process the crime scene at the home of William and Lillian Doy, a couple in their mid-sixties. There were casings on the living room floor. Uh, the uh, Mr. Doy was still in his bed. And his weapon of choice, guys, just so you guys know, went, during all of his shootings, pretty much was a 22 caliber pistol, which is a very important piece of information. We'll get into that a little bit later. And he had been shot. Um, Mrs. Doy's room was uh, next to the master bedroom. But she was. I see some of you guys saying uh, Ted. Yeah, no, Ted Bunny did keep some of the heads, guys. Uh, he was also extremely crazy. The thing about the nice stalker, though, was that he used guns. Uh, the Ted Bundy, the Jeffrey Dahmers, etc. These guys enjoyed strangling. Uh, uh, John Wayne Gacy. A lot of these serial killers strangled their victims. Re very rarely, if ever. I don't think any of them used a firearm in any of their murders. Um, but the Night Stalker did. So um, that's what set the Night Stalker apart from these other guys is that he used a variety of different types of tools and weapons to kill people, um, and even a firearm. But Bundy, Gacy, Dahmer, their predominant formula form of killing their victims was typically strangulation uh, because it's a very personal way to kill someone. I mean, I can't even imagine, uh, you know, what the hell that would be like because people, you know, but it's a very personal way of killing someone, stabbing them, etc., being close, looking at them while they're doing it. That's how these weirdos get satisfaction uh, from the murder is being up close and personal. Uh, but the Night Stalker, he didn't do that all the time, as you all saw with the, fir the first uh, 
murder we saw in I think uh, March of '84 with uh, Dale, uh, with Dale, he just shot her in the head. You know, as she was coming back to get some groceries. An invalid, so she had her own room. Uh, she had been uh, sexually assaulted. It always is distressing to go into a crime scene. William Doy had been quickly dispatched with a gunshot to the head. 63-year-old Lillian had been restrained with thumb cuffs, beaten, terrorized. That was something else that they were able to identify uh, Rich Ramirez with was the thumbs cuffs. Like, who the hell is going to have thumb cuffs? Like, what the fuck? Like, what? you know, you got to that's what a very um, peculiar piece of equipment to use that you can only typically find in certain sex stores. So, yeah, this guy was sadistic and raped but the killer had let her live it was unusual for a serial murderer to f have two people shooting one and acting like a serial murderer with the other one men he was killing and that made him harder to catch because they were the obstacle to yes so gil carrillo here guys and um salerno are the two main detectives that did this case and Salerno, by the way, had arrested the Hillside Strangler just before this. So these two detectives that did this case, this guy was a, was a rookie at the time, pretty new to the Homicide Bureau. And the other guy, Salerno, Frank Salerno, I think his name was, he uh, had just solved the Hillside Strangler, which was another big serial killer case that occurred uh, at that time in Los Angeles. Get to his lust, the women. It was an issue of control. It was an issue of not being overpowered what husband or man would lay there and not intervene in trying to keep his partner from being attacked. Despite the many inconsistencies, Detective Gil Carrillo suspected that just one man was responsible for all the crimes. I felt very strongly there was a serial killer going on. Back at the time, there were uh, two renowned psychologists, one from New York and one from uh, locally here on the West Coast from UCLA, that essentially said that we were full of hot air, that one man was not capable of performing what we were alleging. Yeah, so Gil was one of the first detectives to say, yo, this is one guy, you know, just from the way he's breaking it, et cetera, but everyone else thought it was more. And at the time, remember, guys, this, this is serial killers were relatively new uh, to law enforcement in the United States back then in the 80s. Like, you know, we had just dealt with the John Wayne Gacy's and the bunnies at this point. So people were still kind of like, ah, this is kind of a new phenomenon. I think that they kill the same way every single time, etc." So the FBI had just built up their FBI profiler program at this point. So we're in the early stages of dealing with serial killers, man. So to them, you know, the way the night stalker moved was way too erratic, way too unpredictable. And they were like, this is, this has got to be the work of multiple people. This can't all be linked, but you know, shout out to these two detectives. Uh, Carrillo and Salerno for sticking to their guns and say, no, this is one fucking guy. Six weeks later, in the leafy city of Monrovia, two sisters, both in their 80s, were discovered in the home they shared. One had been raped. Both had been severely beaten with a hammer. Here again, there was something new. There was a whole aspect of the occult. There were some pentagrams, some things written on the wall. Look at this guy putting fucking pentagrams on the crime scenes, man. <laughs> Evil shit, bro. There were some uh, markings on the body. The crimes appeared related, but defied. So he marked the pentagram on their body. The current theories regarding serial murder. When I was first contacted about the murders. Police were baffled. They had no idea who was doing this, how it was happening. They wondered what type of a person would have done this. I mean, was it a maniac? Uh, was it a group of people? Uh, because don't forget in California, they had Charles Manson, who with his cult went out to murdering an awful lot of individuals. But my impression was that it was a single individual. It was someone who was not insane, who was not showing outrageous behaviors, and that he was probably young. He was probably either Caucasian, Hispanic, uh, but he was certainly not a standout in his community. 
the press would dub the mystery killer the Night Stalker. And those who had known him would never have suspected what he was capable of. All right, so now they're going to go into his background, which we already covered that uh, uh, on the pr prior um, part of the show. So now the guy's going wild all over California, right? Or sorry, all over L.A. But he goes ahead and takes his talents to San Francisco. And San Francisco now is about to meet the demon known as Richard Ramirez. So let's get into it. Ramirez, aware of the growing media spotlight on his crimes, had moved north to San Francisco. And on August the 18th, 1985, Ramirez killed outside of L.A. for the first time. It was a Saturday morning. Uh, my partner, Carl Klotz, and I were the on-call homicide team. And this is the main detective that was on the case on the San Francisco side, which, by the way, over there in San Francisco, guys, they call their detectives inspectors. OK, um, so get used to that term when we t deal with uh, San Francisco Police Department. This is also going to come up when we cover the Zodiac Killer as well. And we received a call to respond to Eucalyptus Street out by the San Francisco Zoo. Uh, there was a murder. So we responded out there and the crime scene that we witnessed uh, was atrocious. The husband had been shot and killed. All right. What you guys are about to hear is fairly graphic. So, um, yeah. Viewer discretion is advised. Uh, this crime scene was really bad. While he was asleep in bed, uh, the wife had been removed to the San Francisco Emergency Hospital. She had been raped, shot, and left for dead. The intruder had gone into the refrigerator, eaten their food, drew uh, satanic symbols, the pentagram on the walls in the house, he vomited after he ate their food, and then he masturbated on their carpet. A uh, very sick crime scene. Bro, could you imagine this shit? Like, bro, <laughs> you know, you're a fucking detective from San Francisco. You have no fucking clue, right? You walk into a crime scene like, oh, we got two dead. And you walk in. Wait, why is there a vomit? Is that semen? Wait, he shot them? What the fuck? Like, yo, seriously? you? I would be like, what? like, bro, wild. What the fuck? Shit, okay? Like, literally ridiculous. One of the worst crime scenes ever for this guy. <laughs> every time, because I've seen a couple interviews with this detective, every time he describes this crime scene, he always has that face like, bruh, what the fuck, man? So, yeah. It, it, like, the fact that he sat there for a while, he actually jerked one off onto the couch, like, or into the carpet. Like, what the fuck, man? Uh, indicating a very disturbed mind. 25-year-old Ramirez had begun worshipping Satan in his late teens and would often leave pentagrams at the scene of his crimes. He also slept in graveyards in his youth as well, guys, in his teenage years, uh, especially after his uh, cousin was arrested, which we went over detail on that one. Now, that is not absolutely unique to Ramirez. There are lots of serial killers who engage in Satan worship, as did Ramirez. The shocking graffiti was not enough to immediately point investigators towards Ramirez. The unfortunate couple murdered in their San Francisco home were 66-year-old Peter and 62-year-old Barbara Pan. Everything we found out about Barbara and Peter Pan, uh, the, these were just a lovely older couple living a peaceful life, never expecting to be attacked while they were asleep in bed. Both my partner, we had seen an awful lot in our time on the police force, but we were both moved beyond normal for a homicide scene. Frank began investigating the couple's murder, unaware that their death may be linked to California's most notorious serial killer. That afternoon, after this initial crime scene visit, my partner and I went back to the office and we put out an all points bulletin. This is an alert up and down the state of California regarding all the information that we had. And one of the key things that we had was that our victims were shot with a 22 revolver. Also, just so y'all know, this is the, the couple that was uh, killed. This is a family photo of them. Uh, rest in peace uh, to the Pans. But yeah, this was um, two days after the Diamond Bar attack, San Francisco police were called to the scene of a now all too familiar crime. 
Uh, the husband, 60 year old, 66 year old Peter Pan, had been shot and killed. The wife, Barbara Pan, was raped and short, shot, but survived the attack. A satanic symbol was carved into the wall. Um, and I believe it's these two right here. So, yeah, man, terrible stuff, terrible stuff. And we had the slug for comparison. A very alert, active sergeant in the Glendale Police Department that was working the Valley Intruder case, a man by the name of John Perkins. John calls us and says, you might want to check the Valley Intruder. It's, he always uses a 22 caliber revolver. That connection there put us into the Los Angeles cases. Bam, and that's how they're, they were able to link it to the guy. Like I said before, right, using a 22 caliber gun, same gun the whole time, uh, that's how we're, they were a big part of how they were able to connect the two investigations. That particular day, uh, August 18th, 1985. After committing a murder outside the LA Valley region for the first time, the newspapers had renamed the killer the Night Stalker. All of a sudden, uh, the media blew this case up to be something very, very big, which it was. And now we had a link with Barbara and Peter Pan in San Francisco. So the murder count was going up every weekend. And people all over the state of California were very, very frightened. Frank began looking into other. Yeah, guys, uh, people were freaking out at this point, man. You got a guy because think about it. And not only was he like, like, it's not like he was like killing people on the street, or whatever. He was breaking into their house when they were asleep and doing this. Right. And and the thing is, is that his victims, he didn't care. It wasn't like he was Ted Bundy going after brown haired girls right at the beach with a cast on like, oh, I need some help. Or Jeffrey Dahmer going after the gay community or John Wayne Gacy, you know, killing employees that work for him at his, you know, his company. Right. His um his remodeling company or whatever. No, it was anyone. He didn't give a shit. He was breaking into your house stealing your stuff and it was in nice suburbs where people had their doors unlocked it was safe crime was low so um people were terrified man and then on top of that now they're able to link the two crimes from la all the way up to san francisco everywhere in between the people are like what the hell is going on here man so yeah man he was abducting kids molesting them as well there were a lot of victims that he abducted abducted that he didn't actually kill so um, and they didn't end up bringing the kids to trial and charging him on those crimes because he was facing death penalty on the adult stuff. They didn't want the kids to have to testify. But yeah, man, this guy was all over the fucking place. So people were terrified. Um, I, I would say the Night Stalker probably caused just as much fear uh, and terrorized the community. Probably one of the worst ones. I would say him and the Zodiac Killer are up there, man. Um, at this point in the 80s, too, you guys got to remember, like, TV was a thing. It was common for people to have TV, uh, TVs in their households, the radio, etc., newspapers. So he was all over the place. And the methodology is what, the way he com committed his crimes is what had people terrified. Gun sales soared in the summer of 1985, by the way, in California. The recent crimes in the San Francisco Bay Area and found a burglary report filed by a fellow detective which had all the hallmarks of a night stalker break-in. In that report, we found out that the intruder climbed through a bathroom window. They were not at home. Their young niece, I think she was 16 years old, she was home by herself. Hearing somebody come through the bathroom window, she panicked. She went downstairs and hid into a closet. Fortunately for this young lady, the intruder never found her, ransacked the house, stole a bunch of valuable jewelry. Luckily, the homeowner had added his social security number to his wife's jewelry, just in case it was stolen. Oh, wow. And before too long, 290 miles away, the police got a match. Bam. The big break in the case came is when this bracelet with the serial number ends up in Lompoc, California, turned in by a confidential informant of a police sergeant on the Lompoc Police Department. While Frank headed to Lompoc to interrogate the informant, Richard Ramirez had already left San Francisco and traveled 430 miles south to Mission Viejo. There he stole a car 
before carrying out another brutal attack on August the 24th, 1985. This All right, so just so because a lot of things are happening here, guys. So I want to explain so you, so you guys kind of know what's going on here. So now in San Francisco, they're able to tie back a piece of jewelry to an informant in Lompoc, California. So San Francisco PD is like, OK, they got an informant down there who has information on this jewelry that was stolen. We got to figure out who the hell this guy is, because this guy is responsible for the murder of the pans in San Francisco. So you got San Francisco PD conducting their investigation, right, which they've been, been able to link to the Night Stalker at this point. So they're on high alert for this guy. Meanwhile, you got Los Angeles uh, County uh, Sheriff's Office, right, which is where Carrillo and Salerno are from, can, uh, doing their investigation down in L.A. on the Night Stalker as well. So you got two different police departments, San Francisco Cisco PD and Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, conducting their own independent investigation, somewhat sharing information, but not really. There was quite a bit of um, tension bet between the two agencies, especially since uh, up in San Francisco, they had made a brutal, uh, a very bad mistake where the mayor had disclosed police only information, which had fucked up the investigation. Uh, but that's a whole other uh, topic. But it's important for you guys to realize that there's two separate things going on here where SFPD now is going to go talk to this informant, which I might play a clip for y'all here, actually. Um, you know what? Let me go ahead and find it for y'all. I got the clip here where they're able to talk to this informant, okay? So let's go ahead. Since we're on Twitch anyway, this is from Netflix, guys. All right. Are you not detained? He said, I don't know his last name. He's never told me his last name. But it was obvious that he thinks my. So here's that piece of jewelry, right? Be linked to the Night Stalker case. And he tells me he got the bracelet from his wife's mother. She'd lived in San Pablo, California. So we headed out that morning to find her. She told us that she got the bracelet from her boyfriend named Armando Rodriguez. He got that bracelet from his friend from El Paso. And Armando is the informant. Who she only knew as Rick. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. She told us that Rick wore a black ACDC hat. Wore Which, by the way, guys, witnesses had identified that black ACDC hat and the members only jacket is what the night stalker would wear during the commission of his crimes. So Our black members. Only. So obviously SFPD is like, Oh Lee, here we go, baby. You know, the jacket had bad teeth. The more I told you guys about his bad hygiene, that he had that pungent order and his teeth were terrible. Okay. And, and he would wear all black. She spoke. The more we knew, we were on the track of the Night Stalker. Armando Rodriguez lives in El Sobrante, California. And we're only minutes away. And as we pull up to the address, we stood outside the gate. Next thing I see is Armando coming out of the house, walking toward me. And I said, listen, Armando, we need your help. We need you to help solve probably one of the biggest and most important cases in the history of the state of California. It definitely was. <laughs> your friend Rick is a very brutal killer. You're going to help. So all they had was a sketch, guys, and they knew the name was potentially Rick. They didn't really know who the hell he was yet at this point. Let's break the Night Stalker case. Now his tone changes. He's not the Night Stalker. I'm not helping you at all. So I grab him by the shirt and I physically place him in the car. I turn. Well, Lisa was a lot different back then, baby. <laughs> Polisa was a lot different back then, guys. Hey, get the fucking car. All right. Uh, so he puts this dude in the car and he's trying to figure out who the fuck his friend Rick is. And I said, look, Armando, you could do yourself a big favor. Cooperate with us. 
We need the last name of your friend, Rick. Do you understand me? Fuck you. <laughs> and I'm looking at him. When I talk, I close my fist. So, you want to fight, you motherfucker, tough guy? And this yeah. shit come up. And I struck a short jab. It wasn't my best punch, but it definitely wasn't my worst. He touches his cheek. Is that as hard as you can hit? Oh, shit. Let's get ready to rumble! Here we go. I looked at him, and I flashed back on the crime scenes. The pans, the vomit, the masturbation. And I said, pretty boy, I'm going to split you from the top of your head to your ass. Oh, shit! My oh, fist shit! Up against the windshield. And I started over the backseat. Bong! Just starts <laughs> wailing on this fucking guy, bro. Hell bent on demolishing this guy. He threw his hands up in a cross and he fell back in his seat. And he said, Richard Ramirez, Richard Ramirez. Oh, shit. <laughs> Police brutality for the win, huh? <laughs> Yo. Yo, I'll tell you this, though. He was mad as fuck because, guys, wow. again, I'm not going to sit here and defend his actions, but the guy did put his fist against him. Hey, you want to fight? Whatever. And, you know, at this point, they got an enormous amount of pressure on them to figure out who the fuck this guy is. This Night Stalker dude. He's pissed. Right. Like, yo, this dude went into a crime scene, killed two innocent people, vomited. Well, well he ate their food, vomited on the floor, masturbated on the rug. He's mad as fuck. Stole some jewelry. He's like, yo, I want to figure out who the hell this guy is. So this informant says, oh, yeah, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. So. Yeah, the 80s were different, baby. <laughs> they were a lot different. Brutality. You hit that boy with the... Oh, you can... <laughs> now, so, as like I said before, there's two independent investigations going on, right? SFPD gets a name, Richard Ramirez. However, LAPD is conducting their own investigation, and they're the ones to actually 100% fully identify Richard Ramirez. And we're going to talk about that right here. Um... I'm going to pull it up for y'all real fast. All right. Put that behind us. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and play portion for y'all real fast. Let me move this out the way. How they actually identified this. Time over. the victims were. All right. Right here. The Romero family was returning to their Mission Viejo home from a family trip. Their 13-year-old son, James, was wide awake at midnight while the rest of the... And this is the August 24th um, attack, 1985. ...family was sleeping. The Romero family home was situated next to a steep hill and wasn't fenced in, so oftentimes animals would pass by. In the early hours of the 25th, James left the house to retrieve his pillow that he'd forgotten in the family camper. He walked past the driveway and heard the sounds of crunching footsteps coming from the gravel path to the backyard. Romero later recalled, I kind of looked up on the hill and I was like, oh, it's probably a dog or a cat or a possum. So James Romero went to investigate, but after finding nothing, he went to work on his mini bike in the garage. But then the sound of footsteps came back. And this time, James knew that it was no animal. The sound was coming from right outside the garage. James later told a reporter, I could hear the footsteps literally stop right where I'm sitting. All right, so James, this is the witness right here, guys. James Romero, this guy ended up being a critical way, you know, W James in the chat for fucking uh, him being a witness to this situation. Let's go ahead and play it uh, from the Netflix series. I was working on a bike. He saw a car drive up driving kind of slow looking around and he thought it was funny and then he saw it leave again the young man he recalls a partial plate of that vehicle that's huge and the description of the car that gets released to the news media and we receive a call from an individual who says he had a friend who had a very similar car stolen recently in Chinatown. Well, just like lightning hit me and I realized, well, Bill's 
Bill's Toyota's orange. I wonder if there could be a connection. And the plate that was on that stolen car matched the partial plate that the young man down in Orange County had uh, remembered. Oh, boy. So we're getting closer, right? So basically, SFPD gets a name Richard Ramirez from, you know, a little bit of uh, <laughs> fighting. Hadouken! Right? The detective and that fucking guy, Armando, or whatever his name is. <laughs> it is a street fight, pretty much. Right? Um, and now LAPD is doing their own thing, finding him. The car the killer may still have was stolen. So they got the stolen vehicle with a partial plate identified. In L.A.'s Chinatown this weekend. It is a 1976 Toyota station wagon, orange in color, license number 482RTS. The car was located uh, at 6th and Alexandria in downtown L.A. in a parking lot. This is Laurel Erickson in the Rampart area where the stolen car was spotted. Dozens of detectives stake out the area, hoping the killer will come back. We sat on it for a little bit, then decided he's not coming back to this. Yeah, he ain't that stupid. He ain't coming back, bro. Stupid. At this point, he knew that it was going <laughs> to, the police were watching it. Car. Orange County Crime Lab processed the car. And I see some of you guys wondering, yo, why am I not on YouTube? Guys, they took it down on YouTube. Don't worry. I'm going to re-upload this on YouTube as soon as it's done. So don't worry. It'll be back up in full with timestamps. And they were able to pull a, a latent fingerprint off the rearview mirror where apparently the suspect had reached up and adjusted it. Bam. So they got a fucking fingerprint off the stolen vehicle, guys, which is huge. OK. And it was a good one. They were able to get it right off the, the uh, one of the mirrors. So this is going to be a big fine. Let's get let's get into it more. Obviously, it's the 1980s, though. We now have a live fingerprint, but we didn't know who the print belonged to at that time because the fingerprints were not automated. We had to have a suspect fingerprint card and examine the fingerprint card against the latent print. But we had to wait until we got a suspect. All right, August 27, 1985. So a few days after that attack, uh, and uh, in that area that we we're talking about before. Anything suspicious. And just so y'all know, bro, back in the 1980s, they didn't have this right here, which is called IAFIS, okay? Uh, privacy Impact uh, Assessment. Oh, sorry, hold on. So IAFIS, guys, is um, a way, right, that the government is able to go ahead and c keep a log of all fingerprints in the United States. Back in the 80s, they didn't have this type of technology. So they had to go ahead by by hand, right, and and manual labor, uh, look at the fingerprint and look at ridges and be able to identify, okay, is this the person? You take a fingerprint expert and they would be able to, you know, be able to co conclusively identify if the subject was the same person. And you had to have those fingerprints already um, there. At uh, That person had to have been arrested before for them to, able to do it, be able to do it. So it's not as easy as it is now where you're able to do the biometrics and figure out who it is within a, you know, a minute or two. Back then, you had to do it by hand, which obviously was much harder. But the good thing is they at least had a print at this point. We want them to call what may seem very unimportant to someone else could be extremely important to us. We get a call. And IAFIS stands for, guys, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. Okay. Um, so, and that allows, that's that's the, like, database that talks to all the other different agencies where all the fingerprints are, where you're able to link suspects that have been put in the system. All from a female, and she said her father was sort of a street person. He hung out down by the Greyhound Bus Depot, Skid Row. And he had befriended an individual named Rick. Oh, here we go. And he thinks Rick might be the Night Stalker. So we sent a team out there right away. I mean, immediately. Found the father. He eventually told him, yeah, Rick, he's from El Paso. And one of the key things he told us was Rick had told him about a murder he committed in Monterey Park, Asian couple. And, that he, mm, and that's one of the victims that they had identified. He used a 22 semi-automatic pistol. That information definitely wasn't out there. 
And he also told us that. And guys, that is huge. The fact that the person was able to give them a piece of information that the public didn't know and only the police knew go, does what? Gives credibility to the witness that, oh, this information is solid because we didn't release that. At this point, guys, right, the police had been all over the news talking about this nice stalker. Hey, we need your help to find him, etc. Obviously, some things they put out to the public, other things they kept close so they can, you know, so that the suspect wouldn't change their pattern of committing the crimes. Two of the things that the police didn't release, guys, were he wore a pair of uh, Avia sneakers that were very distinct, okay, and he was using a 22 caliber pistol to commit his crime. So the fact that this individual is able to identify that is huge for the police and adds uh, some more um, credibility. Uh, he had gotten that pistol from Rick and that he had uh, taken it to Tijuana and given it to somebody. So the two of our detectives took him to Tijuana and they recovered that gun and they recovered a boombox or a big radio also. As it turns out, that radio had been stolen during the Bell and Lang murder. Oh, another connection, guys. So now they got the gun and they got a radio from a victim where the pentagram was left. Bell and Lang's grandson bought the radio for them and he still had the receipt with the serial number and we were able to match it up that way. Receipt and a serial number. Goddamn. L relative, I'm uh, sorry, W relative for hold it, holding on to that goddamn receipt. Because back then in the 80s, man, that's, you know, they didn't have credit cards and, you know, digital receipts and all this other stuff. He said, I don't know his last name. He's never told me his last name. But it was obvious that Rick probably was a killer. All right. So, um, so, and then now you that now the San Francisco portion happens, which we I, I played for you guys earlier. But that's how they were able to identify uh, Rick Ramirez because when they went ahead and ran his fingerprints, guys, they were able to see, oh, this guy had been arrested for some petty crimes of you know burglaries, you know larceny. I think some prostitution charges, uh, nothing too serious or violent. But that fingerprint that they lifted off the vehicle was how they were able to get a, a positive match and identify him definitively as Richard Ramirez, okay? And once they identify him, they put that shit out to everyone, okay? And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Uh, real fast, let me uh, get this going for y'all. So his he's put out there, the police identify him, he's all over the news, so <laughs> he comes back to L.A. and gets a rude awakening in Los Angeles after visiting a brother in Arizona. So he leaves LA for a bit right after in August. It comes back. Ricky walked into the nearest convenience store to buy some candy and he noticed people were, were looking at him. And, uh, and then when he would look at them, they'd look away, of course. And as he was waiting for his change, he looked at the newspapers on the counter. And every paper, there were four or five of them then from L.A. and from the area. Every paper had his picture, his photograph. And then one woman, she said, uh, it's him, El Matador, which is killer in Spanish. Ramirez panicked and fled. So he started running through yards. Could you imagine you committed these murders thinking like, oh, yeah, I'm good. You know, they ain't going to find me. Uh, you know, you go to Arizona to go see your brother. You come back, you know, just getting trying to get some fucking lollipops. Next thing you know, you look at the newspaper and you're like, wait, is that fucking me? And there's some little Spanish old lady like, El Matador. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you imagine that shit? <laughs> Yo, my man was terrified. Across the oh, over fences, he uh, climbed a, about a nine foot sound barrier wall. As he went through yards, people were calling in. They were calling to the Los Angeles Police Department, saying somebody's coming to my yard. I have a prowler. <laughs> Members of the Los Angeles Police Department were already on his trail. They were following the 911 calls. 
continued running east in the northeasterly direction and made it all the way to Hubbard Street. He tries to carjack a female resident. She screams. We were East LA. <laughs> Don't play. We're actually still asleep. Those are the two guys that were involved in getting them. We heard a bang, then a scream. We ran out here. We noticed a tall, dark, skinny guy running and my dad right behind him. We just came running as fast as we can to assist my dad and the neighbors. Richard has been running for about two miles. Pretty much uh, caught up to him about here and uh, tackled him right here up against this fence. Citizens come out and surround him. And he was right here, just sitting down right here. He was bleeding because uh, one of the neighbors had hit him with a fence post right over the head. He was perspiring and huffing and puffing and very looked very tired and uh, scary. He yeah. looked very scary, actually. People just started coming out with the newspapers and saying, that's the killer, the maton, that's, just, you know, a nice talk, Greg. With Ramirez in custody. Yeah, they beat the, you know, they're, they're not doing it justice. Bro, they beat the fuck out of him, guys, just so y'all know. That, that boy was running. <laughs> they caught his ass. They were beating the fuck out of him, bro. It was literally like just a bunch of. Oh, you can, I do, can. So, I think, boom. You know what I'm saying? And that just beat the fuck out this dude, man. <laughs> you know, get over here. All kinds of shit. So yeah, they were beating the fuck out of him, guys. The police actually showed up and saved his life. If they didn't show up, he would have died. They, they, they would have 100% killed him. So um, they're not doing it justice with that. Officers. Um, so, oh, hold on. But now come face to face with the killer. For the first time. When I saw him, he, he just had this evil look in his eye. He just looked so sinister uh, as if he were possessed. He just looked evil. I remember uh, playing with his anxiety level, trying to make it go up and come down. I wanted to see what I could do to raise it or lower it. And Richard was almost to the point of hyperventilation. His head was down on the table and he's going. <sighs> and yo, imagine showing up. Yo, I could imagine like as an investigator myself. I come in, right, to the fucking interview room, right, with my notebook and shit, my partner, and they just do just fucking lie. <sighs> Bro, like some evil shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at him. Look at my guy. All right, bro, I'm out. I'll be back. <laughs> Fuck that shit, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because keep in mind, they have been watch what they've been following this guy for a day, uh, you know a year plus, fourteen months. They seen the pentagrams. They seen the fucked up bodies. They seen the eyes eyes being gouged out. They had interviewed witnesses that had been abducted and molested children. Like, bro, you walk into an interview room and this nigga's just sitting there. <sighs> 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 like bruh <laughs> like what the hell <laughs> yeah I'm uh, I'm gonna need a little bit of time <laughs> you can't offer that guy in McDonald's and get him to snitch who fuck are you gonna snitch on Satan made me do it like what <laughs> <laughs> for a millisecond just for a millisecond I'm becoming somewhat nervous I nigga don't lie he said for a millisecond stop the cap come on man longer than that Stop the cap. Uh, you you know you terrified. You see you walk in, you see this? Fucked up teeth, smelling like like fucking crap. <laughs> yeah. Stop the cap. You were definitely shaky. Knew that this guy was into Satanism and all of a sudden when he starts hyperventilating, I'm saying to myself, if this guy starts levitating, I'm out of here. <laughs> was... Boom God. This is a guy that Although at times there were photographs taken of him that he looked like, uh, you know, wild man. Uh, he, he's not somebody somebody would point out and say, there goes that crazy SOB because uh, he, he just doesn't come across that way. He was much more intelligent than I, than I envisioned. Uh, people think of him as a crazed man. I didn't think he was crazy. 
he was much much more articulate than most murder suspects that I've been. And don't worry, guys, I'm going to play a part. He actually did an interview with Inside Edition. I'll play a part of that interview so you guys can actually hear the the, the monster himself. Interviewed. Ramirez revealed he was well schooled in murder. The impression I got from him was that he was. And here's Frank Slerno. Uh, him and Carrillo are the ones that ran this investigation on the L.A. side. Well read, even though he had dropped out of school, I think after the ninth grade or so thereabouts, he, he was very interested in murder and killing and, and, and past serial killers because he had done a lot of reading on that. He could tell you everything about serial killers from the time the Romans fed the Christians to the lions to modern-day serial killers. When we took him to his first cell, and he found out that that was the cell that Angelo Bono, who was part of the Hillside Strangler duo, that's the cell he was in. He was excited. <laughs> Yo, what? Do you imagine that guy's like, he looked up to other serial killers. And remember, guys, they had just caught the Hillside Stranglers before. And Frank Salerno was the case detective on that case. So he was a little bit more open to talking to these guys. And we told him, all right, we're going to put you in the same cell as that fucking guy. What does he do? He gets it. Uh, he's excited. He's like, oh, yes, this is fucking awesome. So, obviously, they're not dealing with a stable individual here. The Night Stalker had petrified California and haunted Detectives Salerno and Carrillo for five months. Now, he was finally behind bars. I remember seeing my mother and a couple of my sisters, and uh, they came up and we all just started... I started crying. It was over. I said, it's okay. Yeah, this case haunted him, guys. Uh, it, it really fucked him up. He had a lot of sleepless nights. If you watch the, the documentary on Netflix, uh, you know, he, he took like one night, he woke up in a cold sweat. He started searching his own house, trying to clear it. Um, when you do these types of investigations, guys, it really does obsess. Uh, it, like you become obsessed. You know, I, I know what he's talking about. I remember when I had a very big uh, organized crime drug case, I thought about that shit every single day. The main target, I knew everything about him. We're, you know, I was at a pole cam on his house. I was watching that shit before I went to bed. Like you become obsessed with investigations like this. And I can only imagine on the murder side when he's actively killing people, violent crime scenes, it sticks with you. It you it never leaves you. That's why the detective, right, when he was beating on that fucking informant, <laughs> you know, he probably was going, he would had the, the crime scenes in his head and he's fucking angry. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, police officers are human beings. You know, I'm not condoning police brutality or saying like it's acceptable, but when you got that amount of pressure and, you know, you got a fucking idiot saying, oh, you want to fight tough guy raising his fist at you? Yeah, you go punch him, you know, because he has information um, or he's protecting an individual that is ru literally running muck, killing people, killing, abducting children, molesting them, uh, killing innocent old people, uh, shooting people in the head in the dead of the night. Like uh, the Night Stalker was a very bad person, guys. So, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, the, the, um, I, I'm not surprised that, you know, he felt this sense of elation after the nice Darko was caught where he cried after. I mean, yeah, a case like this, uh, you know, make you obsessed. And the fact that, you know, he's been on several documentaries talking about this case after the fact and he's able to recall details. You don't forget certain things, guys. Okay. It's over. In 1989, Richard Ramirez was found guilty of 13 murders and 30 attempted murders, rapes, and sexual assaults. Bam, they got him. He was sentenced to death. And also, I want to let y'all know, when he was at trial, guys, he used to show up in a suit, hair down, sunglasses. He had a lot of groupies showing up to his trial, um, you know, to try to, um, just like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, what do I say about women all the time? They want clout, bruh. So with him, obviously, this thing had hit the news all over the place. So when he did go to trial, it was a, a big deal. And he had a lot of female groupies. A lot of women wrote that to him us, while, yeah. he was in while he was in jail. If I could find the Netflix part of it, I'll let you guys know here. I'm, uh, oh, here we go. Actually, you know what? Speak of the devil and he shall arise. Here we go. I'll show you all real fast. I got the clip right here. He becomes a celebrity while he's uh, in trial. Yes, there were women that wanted to fuck Richard Ramirez simply because he was famous. Anything for club telling y'all, man. Hypergamy.
While many spectators who attended this preliminary hearing believed all along that Richard Ramirez is guilty, there were groupies, young women dressed in black, who wrote letters to the defendants, wrote poems about him, and blamed society for the trouble Ramirez now faces. There was a clown car of these women, right? In all of my years of covering trials in Los Angeles, I never saw a defendant with more sex appeal than Richard Ramirez. I guess that's just the bad boy syndrome. Gone steroids. He had this kind of animalistic magnetism, charisma, that women found attractive. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I think they're the dumbest bitches ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> that bitch keeping it real. Bruh, yeah, all these girls showing up, man. I don't get it. You know, usually you try to stay away from somebody that hurts you or hurts other people, but they want... If I'm not mistaken, that woman that's speaking right now was the witness that saw him with the ACDC hat, the, the, the infamous ACDC hat. I'm going to be right there next to him. Which is mind-boggling. It's bewildering. Because Richard Ramirez wouldn't reciprocate. He'd look at you as dinner. Look at that fucking demented look. Y'all see that shit? Yo, look at this shit, man. Hold on. This dude look wild. Hold on. Kate, he'd look at you as dinner. Look at that, man. That right there is the eyes of a wild person right there, my friends. Holy. All right. But yeah, I mean, uh, this isn't uncommon, guys, for women to show up at uh, murder trials of serial killers. This this act, this act was big with Ten Budney. <laughs> Even Jeffrey Dahmer, who was gay, um, you know, they showed up at his, they, the women showed up in his uh, trial in droves as well. So, uh, I, yeah, uh, hypergamy right there for y'all. Okay, so now that we went ahead and covered the case, guys, uh, instead of me giving you guys a boring-ass summary... <laughs> Let's go ahead and summarize the entire investigation. I found this video here that does a damn good job of doing it. So uh, let's go ahead and summarize. By the time he was charged with the Night Soccer murders, Richard was only 25 years old. It's hard to say that any one or two things that happened up until then is what made him a serial killer. But looking back at his life does provide some chilling clues. Richard was born the youngest of five children on February 29th, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. His mother, Mercedes, worked at a boot factory and his father, Julian, was an army veteran who worked on the Santa Fe Railway. He had a violent temper and was away from the family often. With both parents at work, the kids started getting into trouble. Richard's older brother sniffed glue and broke into houses with their cousin Mike, and Richard spent most of his early days with a babysitter or playing in the yard by himself. When he was two years old, he was reaching for a radio when a dresser fell on his head, leaving him with 30 stitches and a concussion. Three years later, Richard was at a playground when a swing knocked him unconscious. He was rushed to the hospital again and sent home with more stitches. In fifth grade, his parents started to worry. Richard was having seizures in class. It's unclear if the head injuries are what caused them, but Richard was diagnosed with epilepsy that school year, and the seizures continued until he was a teenager. Experts say this could be what caused him to have disturbing visions and vivid dreams. Two years later, those disturbing thoughts took shape. Richard's cousin, Mike... And this is what we talked about in, in more detail, right? So obviously we have the potential situations as to why he ended up being so fucked up. But his cousin, Mike, is the real um, main stimuli as to what um, led to the craziness. You know, it's a combination of things. Fucked up household, abusive father. Um, yeah. Came back from two tours in Vietnam. He was a war hero and Richard idolized him. Mike liked to brag about everything he'd done overseas. He showed Richard the Polaroids he kept of at least 20 women he claimed to have raped and murdered. Mike also taught Richard what he learned as a soldier, stealth, precision, and combat. And what did Richard do? Broke into homes and used stealth, right, to his advantage. He wanted him to know how to fight and kill. Meanwhile, Mike's wife, Jessie, hated that he was spending so much time with his young cousin. She wanted him to get a job, and they argued often. One day that May, she came in with groceries, and Mike took out his 38 revolver. She dared him to shoot her, and Mike did point blank 
in front of both his kids. And they go, well, fuck. Richard. Mike was arrested. And Richard says that's when he became obsessed with killers, crime, murder, and death. Richard read detective magazines and fantasized about the violent sex acts he saw in Mike's photos. At the same time, his grades slipped. He was hunting, stealing, and getting high. And as punishment, he got beatings from his dad. On one of the most brutal nights at home, Richard's father took him to the cemetery and left him chained there for a night. Yo, what? Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Oh, yeah, so y'all can see the craziness here. To escape... And he ended up sleeping in graveyards after this. Julie and Richard moved in with his older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto. Roberto was a peeping Tom, and Richard liked going along on his nightly haunts. By the time he was 15, Richard landed a job at the Holiday Inn. A friend gave him a master key to the room. So he has a cousin who's a war vet slash graper slash killer, keeping Polaroids of his exploits. Then you got another relative who's a peeping Tom, and he would go along with him and look at girls randomly, etc. So you guys can see, you know, he has got a dad that's, you know, chaining him to tombstones at night, making him sleep in there. So you guys can see the childhood uh, here was extremely volatile upbringing. He'd watch people through openings in their curtains, then slip inside once they were asleep to steal valuables. But one night he wanted more. He hid in the closet while a guest was in the bathroom, then tried to rape her. Her husband walked in and fought him off. Richard was arrested, but the charges were dropped when the couple refused to come back to El Paso to testify. When he was 18, Richard left the city for good. He boarded a Greyhound bus and made the one-way trip to Los Angeles. He started using cocaine, and his string of burglaries grew with his addiction. He spent his time studying maps of the city's freeways and neighborhoods, often driving around and sleeping in stolen cars. One night that summer, a woman... And that's why he picked suburban areas to go to, guys, because they kept the doors open. He'd be able to go in there and steal valuables so they could fund his drug habit. A woman downtown asked him to get her some PCP. Later, at her apartment, she turned down his advances, and he brutally raped her. That week marked a shift. Richard found a philosophy that fit his crimes. He started reading books by Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan. Then This fucking weirdo. <laughs> stole another car to attend one of LaVey's satanic ceremonies in San Francisco. Afterward, he called his mother, saying he'd been touched by Satan. Richard wasn't back in L.A. long before he was arrested for auto theft. Real life fucking demon, guys. By the time he was 23, he'd lost touch with everyone in his family. When his sister came to look for him in L.A., she found Richard at the bus depot, almost unrecognizable. He was living in a motel downtown, still heavily addicted to cocaine. That's where things started to get hazy. Up until 2009, police thought the first Night Stalker murder was in the summer of 1984. But sometime in the months after Richard... And that's the one I showed you guys earlier with Dale, uh, the Asian woman that got shot in the head and when she had her groceries. They thought that was the first one. But they find out later on... Richard saw his sister, he made his way back to San Francisco. He was reportedly living out of two different hotels in the city's Tenderloin district. Nine-year-old May Linda Leung lived in an apartment a few blocks away. And that was his real first victim. Police said May was at the building on April 10th with her eight-year-old brother. He left her alone while she looked for a dollar bill she dropped. When he came back to the basement, he found his sister there, stabbed to death. Nine-year-old May Lung was found dead in the basement of her apartment building where she lived in the Tenderloin. Still, even with the evidence, May's murder became a cold case. It wasn't until three years later in 1987 that anyone in the U.S. was convicted of a crime based on DNA. So in 2004, when police reopened May's case, they took another look at the samples and it turned up a match. A DNA... Bam. So they solved the case, guys. What? Damn near 20 years later? In 2009, we were able to match the DNA with Richard Ramirez and <clears throat> that young child. And, you know, he graped her as well. You know, fucking pathetic. And um, luckily, they were able to go ahead and match him. And he actually lost one of his girlfriends because of this, guys. He had, he had been married to uh, a woman, Richard Ramirez, right? One of his groupies. And when she found out that he had, you know, done that to this child in 1984 and they were able to link him back, she ended up divorcing him. 
sample collected in 1984 at the crime scene. They were able to match it with his DNA, Richard Ramirez. Two months after May Leong's murder, Richard was back in LA, cruising in another stolen car. He was out of cocaine and looking for cash. He stopped at a small building in Glassell Park. The window of apartment two was open, so he pried the screen off and climbed inside. The 79-year-old tenant was asleep, but she didn't have anything worth stealing. Richard was enraged. He stood over her bed and stabbed her to death. The victim's son called the police the next day, but Richard hadn't left any fingerprints. For the next eight months, Richard slipped deeper into his addiction and his conviction for the devil. He was stealing cars, mainlining cocaine and breaking into houses, but he wanted to keep killing. He quit using and bought a gun. And that's when the Night Stalker killings escalated. Over the next five months, Richard got increasingly violent, killing at least 14 people and burglarizing, raping, and assaulting others. But by August 30th, everyone knew his name and his face. Which we discussed that in detail, how they were able to identify him between the San Francisco Police Department and the Los Angeles Police Department through fingerprint and through informants. A man by the name of As Richard, Richard Ramirez. Ramirez. Yeah, they did that press conference and everybody knew who the fuck he was after that. Police arrested him the next day. That's looking at him. His head's all bandaged up. That's when he got uh, beat up by those people. What's your name? Huh? Richard was convicted of the Night Stalker crimes, and the whole world learned about his satanic worship. The infamy excited Richard. He wore suits and sunglasses every day to court. Outside of the trial, he was getting massive amounts of attention for the first time in his life. He had multiple girlfriends at a time, 12 to 15 by some accounts. Holy goddamn. The hypergamy, guys, I'm telling y'all, man. But then there was Doreen Leoy. She was a 25-year-old magazine editor who believed he was innocent. She wrote him over 75 love Stupid. letters and was there every day in court. Stupid. Richard trusted her. She seemed to really care about him. So he proposed to Doreen at the jail. A judge in Los Angeles today sentenced Richard Ramirez, the so-called night stalker, killer, and rapist, to death in the gas chamber. After the trial, Richard served most of his time on death row at San Quentin State Prison. He got used to visits from groupies, but in 1992, he got a request from a journalist, Philip Carlo. The two ended up doing over 100 hours of interviews. Four years later, Carlo published the book, a chilling, comprehensive look at Richard's past. And Richard married Doreen in a death row wedding. Reporters flocked to the prison to ask her how she felt. Here's the couple and her response at being the new Mrs. Richard Ramirez. It feels wonderful. I'm so happy. I'm, I'm so thrilled. In 2006, the state of California denied Richard's. Yeah, so he got the, um, he, the appeals got denied and this woman married him, which is crazy. Uh, here, let me, I'm going to pull up something on his wife here in a second. Go ahead, guys. We'll keep going. First round of appeals and upheld his death sentence. The following year, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to review his case. Richard died of lymphoma while still on death row at the age of 53. Good riddance, goddammit. You know, fucking. And it left people with lingering questions. Newscasters asked detectives if Richard ever showed remorse for his crimes. He had no empathy, no feelings, uh, nothing. He wanted to be known as the greatest serial killer that ever, you know, ever lived. Psychiatrists weighed in too. Dr. Michael H. Stone argued that, yeah, he was fucked up, guys. So we're going to go ahead and play a part of his interview from Inside Edition. The horror began in June 1984. Los Angeles was under siege. Death waited in the dark at the hands of a man they called the Night Stalker. After a 14-month reign of terror, he was finally caught. It was only then that his true identity was discovered. His name, Richard Ramirez. Richard Ramirez's whole trip was to hide in a tree or hide behind a fence and watch his victims at nighttime and wait into the wee hours of the night. And then while he slept, creep in, you know, like a coward and, and kill him. The night stalker killed at least 30. All right. So just so y'all know, Leoy, Doreen Leoy, uh, left Ramirez in 2009 after DNA confirmed he had raped and murdered nine year old May Lung. By the time of his death in 2013, Ramirez was engaged to a 23 year old writer. So um, his first uh, girl 
D Doreen Leoy left him. She left. She wrote him seventy five letters. Look at this shit. This is the, in the romantic relationships part. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, 75 letters during his incarceration. 1988, Ramirez proposed to Leoy, and on October 3rd, 1996, they were married in California, San Quentin prison. For many years before Ramirez's death, Leoy stated she would commit suicide when Ramirez was executed. However, Leoy eventually left Ramirez in 2009 after DNA confirmed she had uh, he had raped and murdered that nine-year-old that we spoke about before, which was they linked them, uh, you know, damn near two decades later um, with DNA because DNA wasn't a thing, guys, back then. 13 times, 13 people who were awakened in the night to face death. At least 15 others survived his brutal attacks. I didn't particularly care for people. Uh, In a rare interview, Ramirez refused to discuss his own crimes, but had this to say about serial killers. A serial killer comes about by circumstances and like a, a recipe, poverty, drugs, child abuse. These things, you know, are, contribute to a person uh, to a person's frustration and anger and uh, and uh, at a, some point in life he explodes perhaps for Richard Ramirez that anger and frustration turned to rage which he in turn took out on his victims his killings were so sadistic and brutal that even experienced detectives were shocked well, he took a, a woman in her 60s and stomped her to death with his foot leaving an imprint of a shoe on the side of her face uh, from that to just executing somebody upon walking into a room after he entered a house. He strangled, he used a ligature, he used a tire iron. That's Frank Slerno, much younger, obviously, back then. Him and Carrillo, the two detectives on the case. Aaron on a, on a young girl, a beater, left her for dead. Well, your anger subside if you had to wipe up your mother's blood. I couldn't finish it. I had to leave my brother to finish that chore. Why on earth would you have hurt those people? Why did you kill those people? No comments. No comments. I, I cannot answer it at this time. What was Richard's motive? To kill. That's it. To kill. It's a simple. That's true. I mean, yeah, you can't, you can't keep it any simpler than that. Like, I mean, the dude used every single weapon imaginable. Broke into homes in the dead of night. Used guns, tire irons, ligatures, uh, strangling. You know, violent writing up, uh, you know, pentagrams. He didn't give a shit about anything. His victims were all different shapes, colors, and sizes. He didn't care. He didn't discriminate. It was simply to kill. It wasn't like Ted Bundy where, you know, he went ahead and picked women that had brown hair or Jeffrey Dahmer picking uh, gay dudes. No, this guy was going after anybody. What was that? Richard Ramirez was raised in El Paso, Texas, the youngest of five children born to hardworking, strict parents. Eddie Milam was Richard's best friend back then and remembers when he began to change into a troublemaker. I did start seeing something going wrong with Ricky Ramirez. I think what really messed him up was the acid. He would do a lot of acid. The stealing, you know, I noticed the stealing and then started as a peeping thumb and things like that. Ramirez's passion for burglary earned him the nicknames of Ricky the Thief and Fingers. But Eddie knew Ramirez had other serious problems when he was fired from a local hotel. He said he was fired, he was dismissed due to the cause that uh, he, uh, he had tried to molest them, two little kids that were going up, up the elevator. By eight. He also tried to rape that woman that we talked about before as well when he worked at the hotel in El Paso. Teen Ramirez was a high school dropout drifting around California. He stayed in Skid Row hotels, never seemed to work, but always had the money to buy cocaine. Friends say the Richard Ramirez they knew didn't date. There he is, the distinctive fucked up teeth. They actually, the, the police had set up a, like a sting almost operation at the dentist's office because they knew that he was going to come back, right, to get his teeth fixed, and they missed him by a day. But um, this was actually one of the distinctive identifying things that victims had on him was the teeth, the smell, um, the members only jacket and uh, the ACDC hat, which we're going to go and look at that here in a second. And wasn't the type to commit such heinous crimes. But convicted murderer Martin Kipp, who befriended Ramirez in prison, says he heard another side of the night. Richard told me he needed to associate gruesome violence with sex in order to be completely satisfied. He also told me that he had to violently fantasize about his victims before he could go away sexually gratified. They are desires, whereas if, where if 
I didn't give in to them, I would be crushed by them. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, you, wicked people are born. I'm not going to blame society, or my race, or people, or anything. Uh, it, it is up to the individual, like myself, uh, to, to keep on knocking on, on whatever door they want to get into. Because the victims and the... Damn, well, at least he knows that he's the one that's the fuck up, not society or anybody else. Damn, it takes more accountability than some of these females. <laughs> Crazy deranged serial killer could take more accountability than some of these bimbos that come on the Fresh Fit Podcast at night, man. Goddamn. Methods of killing were so diverse, many experts felt there was no one Night Stalker. Detectives Carrillo and Salerno disagreed and finally broke the case by matching shoe prints. The subsequent trial turned into one of America's most notorious courtroom dramas, punctuated by continual outbursts from Ramirez. In that trial, Ramirez's fascination with Satanism emerged. As far as Satan is concerned, I, I believe uh, in a malevolent being. Uh, his description eludes me, but I, I have felt powers that are evil. After an eight-month trial, Ramirez was convicted of all 13 murders and given multiple death sentences. See, he doesn't give a fuck. He's looking back at his groupies, winking at them and shit with the sunglasses on. I don't care about myself, really. No, I don't care about what happens to me. I never did, really. Damn. Crazy, man. A lot of these serial killers don't. Uh, so what we're going to do, guys, we're going to go back in time a little bit here. And look at some of the evidence that they used. Uh, to get Ramirez. Some so of the iconic boxes, pieces of evidence. This is the actual trial exhibits. So I'm told there were like 40 boxes of this yeah. material. And, and all of these envelopes represent a victim. Yeah. And they were actually going to, the Superior Court was going to toss all this. Can you believe that? Because Ramirez is dead. So. so we have to wear these to protect the files. They are very old. It was in the 1980s. You were yeah. here covering yeah, sure. most of it. Yeah. And what was, you know, it was, it was a long time ago. And that documentary, you know, brought a lot of it back. But yeah. what was, it was just a, such a frightening time because there was these sort of random attacks like all over. So this is incident number one. And where did this one take place? That was Glass Hill Park. Yeah, a lot, a of, lot this, of this it's stuff. So yeah. Yeah. So you can't even look at the pictures. So, you can't even show. so bad. That's so, the thing about him. Yeah. Open window. Yeah. So this so is this a was, case this where. This was Jenny and this stuff. was Saul Homer apartment. If there was murders yeah. and um, sentenced to death, died in prison, nobody shed a tear except maybe his the you women know, that he was wearing. It's this. bizarre. Here's right? that ACDC hat. All this time later, seen wearing. Yeah, it's so, like, I mean, to handle that thing all this time later is. I know, I know. He was wearing. It's this. bizarre, right? I mean, that was like a key identifying characteristic of him. Everywhere he hit. He just left so much destruction and, and, and lives. That but the thing taken. that was so frightening about it from like the public's point of view, remembering back then, was that it was all so random. Yeah. I mean, the locations, the people. I mean, Los Angeles, Rosemead, Monterey Park, Whittier, Monrovia, Burbank, so Sierra so Madre, Glendale, Sun Valley. And, and in the very beginning, it was interesting. They were calling him. Lost them apparently off the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, so those, those sneakers. Yeah, guys. It was so bizarre. Revealed the existence of the that evidence. was mind-blowing so this right? was really bad Hold only on. a handful of these in california and i guess they literally tracked down the stores that have them so this was like good police detective work here um so later where it showed up this is in a flower bed and it's a very good print and, so, can... and you guys can see and that the day before it had rained which is why the the soil was nice and moist they were able to get that fantastic print on that shoe and so it's an unusual know. design so this was like the first strong piece of evidence that they had they later were able to match the shell casings and detective gil carrillo talks a lot about the yeah. shoe print because it turned out to be very unique only one had been sold in los angeles is that i understand well, there are only a handful of these in california and i guess they literally tracked down the stores that had them so it was the avia the avia sneaker which later became, which I think was a size 11, and there had only been one sold, and they were able to pin it down to the fucking store, guys, which is really crazy. Controversial when Diane Feinstein revealed the 
existence of the that evidence. That was mind blowing. And then right? so, he tossed them apparently off the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. So guys, the, so the police had known about these sneakers, right? And I alluded to this earlier, but now that we're on this part of it, now I can talk about it a little bit more freely now that we went over everything. So as you guys know, SFPD and Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office were working together to try to figure out this guy, right? So they went up to do a press conference, right, in San Francisco. The detectives were there from both departments. The fucking mayor gets on air and says, yo, these shoes are what the murderer is wearing. At the time, the public did not know about these shoes, and these shoes were extremely distinct. So when she said that, the Night Stalker, obviously keeping track of what the hell was going on, threw those fucking shoes away, and it fucked up the investigation. And L.A. Uh, County Sheriff's Office was extremely mad because this mayor had compromised the, the fucking investigation because no one had known about these shoes. And it was a very unique piece of evidence because only one pair that size had been sold in Los Angeles. Okay? So, yeah, that was a big fucking deal. And that's actually what caused a huge rift between San Francisco Police Department and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office, okay? Um, and that's why they ended up doing the investigation kind of independently of each other, as I was discussing earlier. This shoe print was a big part of the divide. Yeah. So it's so bizarre because he, he obviously is twisted and sick, but he's following the news. Of course, he doesn't want to get caught. He wants to continue killing people. But what was interesting is that the cops had... They knew about the sneaker. They kept it quiet. In fact, and this is why politicians should never be. About it, yeah. And they uh, asked. This is why politicians don't know what the fuck they're doing when it comes to law enforcement, man. To please not reveal the information, and she didn't. But then Feinstein holds a press conference and tells everybody about the shoe print and the yeah. shoe style. All right, so this is case number seven, and this one happened in Burbank. Yeah. That's an L mayor right there, man. <laughs> So this was May of 1985. He handcuffed his victim. Those are the actual handcuffs. And these are it. But in this case, the victim survived. Yeah. And she had a son then. And he, what he, well, you know, I'll let him talk about it. I, I know this case well as well, but 11 years old, it was present during all this. Apparently it was like locked in the closet. I mean, isn't it bizarre to be like seeing this, holding this? thinking about this. Just I mean, the guy the was just such a sick, through. twisted, evil, you know, SOB. It's like dying in prison was like too good for him. Basically what happened, guys, is he tied the woman up. They're, they're taking too long to get to it. They might not even know. He tied, he, he handcuffed the woman and he, um, he handcuffed the woman and he made her swear to Satan uh, and he let her live and he ended up uh, graping the boy. He graped her and the boy. But he uh, let her live if she swore to stay in, which tells you, uh, you know, how evil of a guy this really was. Um, but yeah, terrible. And he had that members only jacket as well, which I don't know if they pull it out in this in this video. Um, but yeah, man. But in general, guys, that is the Night Stalker. Um, Christina, what are your thoughts? You came in a little bit later. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, he has a literally a sick mind. Get in the mic, woman. Sorry. You always fuck this up. Go ahead. <laughs> um, he has a sick mind, a really sick mind where he doesn't care at all. Like, how do you leave your bodily fluids just right there? Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, the vomiting and the semen, that, that's that's what pissed the San Francisco uh, <laughs> detectives off so much. He, um, ugh, it's yeah, thing. that shit was wild. But uh, guys, don't worry. I'm going to put this back up on YouTube for y'all. Uh, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed the stream. I'll catch you guys after um i put this back up but uh love you guys hope you guys enjoyed the show don't forget to like the video subscribe to the channel uh feta 1811 on youtube feta 1811 rumble fresh fit rumble.com slash fresh fit fresh fit locals.com and uh yeah catch you guys for fresh fit tomorrow for money monday peace